Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to uh, attend this uh, keynote lecture. So this is very specific keynote, very special keynote, because this keynote is actually associated with the kickoff of an important uh, new European project, uh, an innovative training, uh, training network. So uh, that will tackle the holistic uh, study and, and stratification of intervertebral disk um, degeneration by tackling the complexity of the many processes that shapes uh, degenerative process within the, within the intervertebral disk uh, from uh, physical loads to genetic information uh, passing through uh, all the biochemical regulation of, uh, of the cells. This keynote uh, has been chosen, and I'm very grateful that uh, Christine Lemaitre has accepted to give it. Christine is actually an innovative scientist, and uh, she's committed to collaborative research. She has been working in um, intervertebral disc biology uh, since uh, many years now, and uh, in 2008, she moved to Sheffield Hallam uh, University as senior lecturer and uh, she started here actually to, uh, to lead her own research and then later consolidate her own research. So as a leading international scientist in intervertebral disc uh, biology. So uh, she has been uh, actually precursor in working on intervertebral uh, disc mechanobiology, experimentally speaking. And uh, she has kept on uh, gathering evidences, so not only at the biological level, but also uh, relating these evidences so with, uh, with different phenotypes, such as uh, end plate alterations and um, herniations, etc. I won't tell more because, Christina, I, I don't want to uh, spoil anything of uh, what <laughs> you would like to say. I thank you again so for having accepted to give this talk, and the word is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation to present and hopefully everybody can see um, this slideshow screen. So I thought I'd introduce um, the, the concept of this for all by going through some of the research that I've done over the years, looking at um, the pathogenesis of intervertebral disc degeneration and trying to understand whether or not the disc is a source of pain or, or not actually a source of pain. And, and obviously, I think it is, otherwise I wouldn't have spent 20 years of my life uh, researching the intervertebral disc. But why is disc degeneration so important? So disc degeneration is known to be a key cause of low back pain. In actual fact, it's associated with around about 40% of all um, low back pain cases are thought to be linked to degeneration. Now, low back is actually the leading cause for disability worldwide, and it does increase with age, but actually there is quite a high prevalence of the um, individuals within working age, and this has a major impact on people's ability to go to work and actually do normal daily activities. So 80% of the population will experience back pain at some point in their life, and a number of those individuals will go on to develop chronic back pain which becomes extremely debilitating. Sorry, my slides aren't progressing. Now, there's a lot of argument in terms of what are the causes for low back pain, and actually there are lots of different causes for low back pain. There was this really interesting study um, nearly 20 years ago now where they took individuals, took patients um, under local anesthesia and basically poked various different tissues within the spine to see which areas simulated the pain that normally represents their back pain. Unfortunately, we can't do these kind of studies anymore. Ethics won't allow. Um, but this is a really interesting study and it showed that actually there is lots of different tissues within the spine, if you poke them in particular patients, that simulates their pain. But each patient is very different. So there's not a, a common cause for every single patient, and actually it's really multifactorial. And there is a whole host of different reasons which can cause low back pain. So these are just some of the different ones. And this causes a big problem, because it means we can't actually treat the majority of patients with back pain because we can't actually identify exactly what their cause is. And this is complicated further because actually pain is multifactorial. So often you will have a biophysical um, event or some tissue damage that is an underlying effect, but this tissue damage or disease process is often underpinned by the genetic background of that individual. 
It's also associated with comorbidities. So many patients will not just have back pain, they'll have other conditions as well. And the back pain may be secondary to some of those comorbidities or vice versa. And just to make it even more complex, the psychological and social um, environment of those individuals also impacts on how that individual experiences pain and particularly whether it develops from acute pain, which normally resolves after sort of six weeks, into chronic pain. So this makes it a really complex uh, disease process to actually understand. And it's one of the reasons actually why we still have the majority of the treatments are purely symptomatic. This needs to improve. Um, and that's why we do research into sort of what the biophysics is, but also what all of these other elements are that impact the causes of chronic back pain. So is the intervertebral disc a source of pain? As I say, there are studies which suggest that the intervertebral disc accounts for about 40% of all chronic back pain cases. But one of the key issues is disc degeneration is also a normal aging process. So this means it's also there in asymptomatic individuals. So that basically means people without any pain also have features of disc degeneration. So what is different? Is there any features or particular phenotypes which can identify whether an individual is going to experience pain as opposed to one that doesn't experience pain? And a number of years ago, I actually got a personal uh, um, experience of this because this was my spine. So here you can see this large bulge, which was actually my intervertebral disc squeezing out because I've got degenerate discs. And this was pressing on my nerve root. I was ending up that I was walking around with a walking stick until I had a discectomy to take this extruded disc out. Now, the issue is, is my discs on either side are also degenerating. So I have got a bit of an invested interest in getting a better treatment um, because I need treatment myself as well. Now, the isolation and separation between asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals is clearer in younger individuals. So if you look in individuals which are 50 years and under, then there's a very clear association of the MRI imaging of disc degeneration and the association of that with back pain. As you go into the older individuals, because then you've got more of the aging effects, it's much harder to see that association. And if you see a degenerate disc on the MRI images, it's sometimes hard to say whether or not that is actually a cause of the low back pain or whether it's just an insignificant finding. So how does disc degeneration lead to low back pain? So within the, the disc, this is a, a spine with a, some very degenerate discs, this is an MRI image. And one of the things you can see here is these discs are black, so they've lost their water content and they've compressed down. So this is quite a serious case here. Now this decrease in disc height that you can see as you imagine, this changes the mechanics around the actual disc, and that leads to alteration in the structures of those associated tissues, which can lead to the generation of back pain. But in addition, what we've seen and others have shown is that the degenerate discs actually get nerves growing into them, and also they produce factors which can then cause sensitization of local nerve tissues or other tissues which can cause pain. And I'll show some of that data later on. Now, another interesting feature that you can see on MRI is these things called modic changes. And you can just about see it on these discs here, and you can see these whiter regions in the vertebrae. So modic changes are changes in the vertebral bone adjacent to the disc, and there's a strong association of modic change and disc, disc degeneration associated with low back pain. But the real reason for why this association is present is not really understood. So if we consider what the intervertebral disc is, it's basically a tissue that allows you to move and bend and flex. If you didn't have these intervertebral discs in your spine, you would just be very rigid. You wouldn't be able to move at all because you just have basically a metal rod almost up your back. The intervertebral disc is composed of these two particular regions. The central region is a bit like a jelly, or I often refer to it as a jam donut. So if you think of a jam donut, the central region of this jam donut is this squishy middle that if you squish a jam donut, it rebounds when you release the pressure. That's exactly the same in the disc, that the jammy middle 
allows you to compress the disc and this is constrained around the outside by this very strong structure known as the annulus fibrosus which in your jam donut is basically your dough around the outside now of course if this jam donut becomes diseased or degenerated then what happens is the jammy middle can squeeze out causing a disc herniation and this is the same process that can occur within the intervertebral disc so if we look in the disc in a bit more detail what you have is within this annulus fibrosus the actual tissue is basically layer upon layer of collagen fibers and it's a highly organized structure that is made to resist this force of the squishy middle squeezing out onto it the central region the nucleus pulposus is composed of a more disorganized matrix and the main matrix components of this region is composed of agrican which is known as a proteoglycan and this is basically negatively charged so it holds on to lots and lots of water so the fact it holds on to water basically makes the central region of the disc like a gel and that allows it to resist the compression now if you just had this agrican protein within the disc it would just float out so this is also combined with a meshwork made up of type 2 collagen so these factors are what we want in a normal disc now what happens during degeneration is you, your disc changes from this normal disc where you've got this very hydrated central region the nucleus pulposus and this central region starts to lose those proteoglycans so therefore it can't now contain as much water and the disc becomes more fibrotic until finally you can see you've got a very very messed up disc the regions of the mp and the, the annulus fibrosus are mixed all together you've actually got in this case some bone formation and the bones starting to protrude in and this is a very degenerate disc here you can see this as well on the isolated discs that we take from autopsy so this is a young disc which actually is really nice and normal you can see this jelly middle in the middle and then these rings around the outside on the annulus fibrosus when the older individual you can see this looks much more stiff it's more fibrotic and the nucleus pulposus has cracks and fissures within it so what causes these changes so one of the um, essential changes that you get is you get this increased production of enzymes that break down the disc so here what we've got is a methodology we can utilize to identify specific proteins or enzymes in this case within the actual disc and where you see brown that's where it's being produced so these are the cells buried within the deep areas of the nucleus process and you can see there's not very many cells in tissue in this nucleus process but in degeneration you can see these cells are all expressing lots and lots of these enzymes and these enzymes work to break down the local tissue around it and it's one of the reasons why you get those cracks and fissures forming now within the actual disc cells what we also see is you get this production of a cytokine known as interleukin-1 and this was actually the topic of my phd 20 years ago um, but it's still fundamental to our knowledge of the cell biology of the disc because this was quite a novel finding that it's actually the disc cells themselves that are producing this cytokine. Now, interleukin-1 is normally associated with immune cells. So lots of different immune cells produce interleukin-1 and it's thought of as an inflammatory condition. But actually in the disc, unless that outer region of the disc, the annulus fibrosis is ruptured, there are no immune cells in the disc. It's actually considered as an immune privileged site. But what happens is the disc cells are producing this cytokine and they respond to this cytokine. So they produce bucket loads of cytokine and they express the receptor, which is how a cell can respond to this cytokine. And when you treat disc cells with interleukin-1, what you see is you get a down regulation of the good guys. So the expression of matrix genes or um, chondrocytic markers such as SOC6 and you get an upregulation of degradation enzymes. So it seems that interleukin-1 is a key feature in driving those matrix changes that you see during this degeneration. Now, what's really interesting is if you take cells out of a non-degenerate disc and treat it with interleukin-1, 
you don't really see any effect on the further production of interleukin-1. But if you take degenerate cells out of a degenerate disc and treat those with interleukin-1, what you end up with is this perpetual loop, which then causes increased interleukin-1 expression following the treatment of interleukin-1. So as soon as the discs are degenerate, they then start to respond differently to this cytokine, causing more and more being produced. The interleukin-1 is actually involved in lots of different features. So this is just down to really low concentrations. So this is even down to one picogram per mil of interleukin-1. You can see that you get massive increases in matrix degrading enzymes. So MMP3 and MMP13 are both enzymes that can break down the disc. But interestingly, Agrican, which remember is one of those good guys, it's the main matrix of the disc, is actually increased at low levels of interleukin-1, but then decreased at higher levels. So it looks like interleukin-1 is also important in some normal homeostatic mechanisms within the disc. The interleukin-1 can also drive the expression by disc cells of a whole host of other cytokines, um, which then can also cause further damage to the tissue. But also, if you've got rupture, this can then lead to the dri driving in of inflammatory cells. So interleukin-1, as well as inducing cytokines, also induces chemokines. And chemokines' principal function is to pull immune cells in. Now, again, chemokines were always thought just to be expressed by the immune cells, which if you look at these images here, and hopefully you can see my mouse, um, that the immune cells are producing lots of these factors. So these are in discs where you have rupture of the annulus. So these immune cells have now infiltrated. But in addition to the immune cells, the native disc cells are also expressing these chemokines. So this is really important and it shows an, a driving role for the disc cells to call immune cells into the disc as soon as you've got rupture. Interleukin-1 causes increased expression of all of these different chemokines, again, by those disc cells. Um, and it appears that interleukin-1 is a pleothoric cytokine in the regulation of these chemokines. Now, in addition to this increased production of degrading enzymes, decreased production of matrix proteins, and also increased expression of these cytokines, the cells within a degenerate disc appear to undergo a process known as cellular senescence. Cellular senescence is a process where cells can no longer divide, but they still are alive, and they basically just get bigger and bigger and end up as protein factories producing the wrong things. And what we've shown is if you look at discs of increase in graded degeneration, you get increased levels of cellular senescence. This is shown in a number of ways. One way you can look at cellular senescence is the length of your telomeres, which are basically little things on the ends of your chromosomes that protect your DNA. They shorten on every time that your cells divide. And when they reach a particular limit, you get cellular senescence. So in this degeneration, you actually see this decrease in telomere length, suggesting you're getting increased cellular senescence. And if we look at another mark of cellular senescence, P16, if you take non-degenerate discs, you see an increase in P16 levels, i.e. cellular senescence with age. But in the degenerate discs, it's already really high, even in these younger individuals. So it appears that during disc degeneration, you have this accelerated cellular senescence within the discs. Now, this cellular senescence is actually associated with a phenotype known as senescence-associated secretory phenotype. And this is also seen within the disc. So we see that we have a clear correlation between the levels of this senescent marker and the levels of matrix degrading enzymes within native disc tissue. And interestingly, this has been recently shown within cancer cells to be regulated via DNA damage. So some recent work from my laboratory has investigated whether we are to get DNA damage and this activation of senescence associated secretory pathway is driven via DNA damage. So the pathway is known as CGAS sting. So I'm just gonna go through this in a little bit more detail. So basically within your cell, your DNA should be in the nucleus of the cell. But what happens during DNA damage 
is this is first of all is recognized by a protein known as gamma H2AX. And when you look in the disc, in degenerate discs, you can see the expression. This is then shuttled out of the nucleus if it's damaged into the cytoplasm, known as cytoplasmic DNA, which you can visualize down the microscope. And this is a cell within a native disc tissue. And you can see these little blobs of blue. This is basically where this DNA has been shuttled out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm of the cells. So the cellular machinery then recognizes this with a protein called C-gas, which again is expressed in degenerate discs. And this causes the activation of an intracellular signaling pathway, cyclic GMP, and activation of the sting pathway. This sting pathway then causes activation of a number of intracellular signaling pathways, such as nuclear factor kappa B. And nuclear factor kappa B is a key pathway that regulates a whole host of inflammatory cytokines. So it appears that within the disc, this is actually a molecular pathway which is occurring where we're getting DNA damage leading to cytoplasmic DNA, and that eventually leads to this increase in inflammatory cytokines and could explain one of the mechanisms by the increases of interleukin-1, for example. If we look at the expression of these gamma H2X and the C-gas, just to see if it's associated with cellular senescence, in disc cells which show high levels of cellular senescence, we also see high levels of both C-gas and gamma H2AX. Now, the disc isn't just cells, it's a very complex environment that these cells need to live in. And even in the healthy disc, it's a very harsh environment. So the disc is the largest avascular tissue within your body. And what I mean by that, the blood vessels are only located around the very outer edge of the annulus fibrosus and at the top and the bottom of the disc through the end plates. So what this does is it leads to a very low oxygen concentration, a low nutrient supply to the cells of the disc. And also because the disc is very rich in proteoglycans, that holds on to lots of water. So the osmolarity, which is your balance of salts to water, is much higher in a disc tissue than most other tissues. The disc is obviously underneath load all the time. Um, and also the pH, because of the nutrient supply is so low, it's actually um, a lower pH. Now this gets a whole lot worse with degeneration and there's lots of different risk factors which have been associated with degeneration, leading to the increased production of these cytokines and the degradation of the disc. So now what you see is an altered osmolarity because you've got changed levels of proteoglycans and water within the disc. You have altered biomechanics and also the pH becomes extremely acidic. So the cells of this need to be able to respond to these various um, stimuli. So I'm just gonna show you a few of the information that we've got, which demonstrates how cells can respond to some of these stimuli. So the first thing I'm gonna show is the response to load. So if we take these cells isolated from tissue, um, we grow those out in the laboratory, and this is what they look like uh, when we look down a microscope when you attach them to plastic. Now, the issue with that culture is they lose their normal um, cellular phenotype that they have within the disc. So what we do is we then put them into a 3D cell culture system, which allows them to maintain or regain their phenotype in the disc. This is a very old loading system. We've got much newer ones now um, in Sheffield. This is one that I worked on in Manchester. But basically where we had this hydrostatic loading system um, and we basically took little bags of culture media and floated our little beads uh, with our cells in, in these bags. And that would then allow us to apply hydrostatic loading to the discs to simulate normal physiological loading. And what we saw that actually within healthy loading regimes are disc cells extracted from non-degenerate um, discs show a positive response. So you see increases in factors that you want to have expressed. So remember that agrican and type 2 collagen, these are things that you want to be there, and a decrease in the um, matrix degrading enzymes, although this particular one wasn't significant. However, when you take cells from degenerate discs, they lose this response and they don't act um, as positively to these normal physiological loads. So they now are not stimulated to produce the normal matrix, which they should be doing within the disc. 
And actually, what you see is we see altered mechanotransduction in disease. And this is another system that we can use to apply different loads uh, to discs, where we basically, this time, we culture ourselves again in this 3D environment and put them under these little platens that you squish down. And this allows you to also add various different treatments or inhibitors to the actual tissues while you're loading or cells when you're loading. So one of the key mechanisms that a cell can respond to load is through these membrane receptors known as integrins. So the integrins are a key membrane receptor that allows the cell to bind to its extracellular matrix. So take that agrocan on collagen 2, for example. So the cells are bound to their external matrix via these integrins. And then when the tissue is loaded, that load is passed through the extracellular matrix signal through the integrin into the cells. So what you can do is you can actually buy inhibitors of these integrins and these inhibit a particular binding site by which the integrin binds to the extracellular matrix. And actually, if you load cells following the treatment with this inhibitor, what we see is we get different responses um, following this inhibitor response in non-degenerate and degenerate discs. So the load here that we're applying is now more of a degenerating load. So we see that in the non-degenerate and also the degenerate cells, when you apply the load, you see down regulation of agricam. When you put a control peptide in that isn't doing anything, that's just a, a negative control, you get the same responses. But what was really interesting is when we inhibited those integrins in the non-degenerate disc cells, we saw total abrogation of the ability of those cells to respond to that load. So this shows that the integrins are really important in that mechanotransduction pathway within the non-degenerate disc cells. However, in the degenerate disc cells, we did not see that inhibition, showing that we've got a change in the mechanotransduction pathways within the degenerate discs. It wasn't because the integrins weren't expressed, and you can see that the, the integrins are still expressed by the disc, but they're not functioning that way, and the cells are now responding to load in a different way. So I'm going to switch tack a little bit now and talk about the osmolarity. Um, so I mentioned that the disc, sorry, I mentioned that the disc is, um, has lots of water in there, so, and also during diurnal loading. So if you think about it, now you're probably all sat on your chairs, you're not really loading very much, but normally you'd be a bit more active when we're not all locked up at home. Um, during the day, you're constantly loading your disc. So what happens is that squishes the water out of the disc. When you lie down at night, that water flows back into the disc. So the disc constantly increases and decreases disc height, but the water content changes with that process. So the cells need to be able to adjust to the constantly changing levels of water in their surrounding environment. And one way they can do this is via these membrane receptors known, sorry, membrane channels known as aquaporins. And the aquaporins are found, so this is a cell membrane, and these little red blobs with little white bits are water molecules. So this is on the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. And if we isolate one of these aquaporin channels shown over here, and if you follow this little yellow blob of water, you can see it's moving through this channel. So these are basically passive channels that allow water to flow in and out of cells so they can stay equilibrated to the tissue around them. And that's really important because if they can't do that, they will actually basically just swell up and explode or shrink down so they can't actually um, you know, function anymore. And interestingly, disc cells express loads of these proteins. So they actually express eight different apoporins, and, and we've shown some of these change during disc degeneration. So aquaporin 1 and aquaporin 5 are just two examples I'm going to talk about. So these are both down-regulated during disc degeneration. And if you treat disc cells with different concentrations of um, salts and water to get different osmolarity, you can actually induce changes in these aquaporins. So the 425 osmolarity is actually that you experience in a normal disc. 
and the naught hours is actually the conditions in a degenerate disk. So what you can see is if you switch the environment from a degenerate osmolarity to a normal osmolarity, you can actually get increased levels of these agroforins within the disk, which could protect the disk um, and be able to respond more to that diurnal loading. Now, the way that cells respond to this osmolarity is via a transcription factor known as TON-EVP. So transcription factors are basically factors which can drive the expression of different genes. And TON-EVP is a very well-known factor that drives the response of the, all these different osmotic response genes, um, which are upregulated when you get increased osmolarity. TON-EVP is expressed within the disc, and we see really good correlation with these with different classical response genes. So what we wanted to see was whether TON-EBP is also linked to the aquaporin regulation that we saw with osmolarity. So what you can do in the lab is you can manipulate the genes within cells. And here what we do is we knock out the levels of TON-EBP. So this is just showing that we've downregulated how much TON-EBP that we've got within our cells, both at gene and protein level. Now, when you do that, you also see this downregulation of those water channels, the aquaporin one and aquaporin five. And actually, if you do this in a mouse model where you can do it in the whole organ, during development, if you knock Tony BP out, you actually see that you get less aquaporins being expressed within the mice discs um, during development. So this demonstrates that the TON EBP is also important in your aquaporin expression. Now, what we propose is actually this is linked to the changes we see during degeneration, because in disc degeneration, in a healthy disc, we've got this high osmolarity, we've got lots of aquaporins being expressed, and the cells are very responsive to TON EBP with upregulation of the response genes and also leading to what regulation of those good guys, the matrix genes such as agrocan, et cetera. During degeneration, we've now got a decrease in osmolarity. We've got less of the aquaporins being expressed and also increased expression of various cytokine receptors, which can also signal through ton EBP. And this switches this anabolic response you see in the healthy disc to a catabolic response in the degenerate disc and now again drives those cytokines which are being produced. So this is all well and good and gives us a really um, improved understanding of how the cells are interacting, how their envi environmental conditions affect that cell biology, and it gives us a better understanding of how the disc works. But is the disc a source of pain? So in order for any tissue to be a source of pain, you need to have nerves there, it needs to be innovated. And there is a number of papers out there which have demonstrated that nerves do indeed and grow into the disc. Um, and we've also shown that as well, um, and showing that the nerves can associate with blood vessels, particularly in the annulus fibrosis. And this here, the blue is blood vessels and red is a nerve. Um, but what was really interesting, when we use um, a method in immunochemistry to detect these very fine nerves, what we actually found was a lot of the very central tissue regions, those nucleus pulposus tissue, in degenerate discs actually also contain nerves. And we found that 52% of our samples extracted from patients undergoing um, disc removal for, for back pain and nerve root compression expressed nerves, but they didn't express the blood vessels. 16% expressed both and 4% only expressed blood vessels. So this is really interesting and actually suggests that the nerves could be pulled in without the need for blood vessels. Previously, the dogma was always that you needed the blood vessels and the nerves would follow, but actually they seem to be able to go in deeper than the blood vessels. They are always closely associated with cracks and fissures. So you see these nerves not too far away from cracks and fissures and this was about the furthest that we measured a nerve to a space and this isn't surprising because it's been previously shown that the disc matrix of so that agrican that good guy also inhibits nerving growth so if you've got a fissure you've not got any agrican there so therefore the nerves could migrate down here and then come into the tissue but nerves don't come in alone they have to have some kind of signals 
that call them to arms. So in the disc, these are produced by the disc cells themselves. Oh, I've just lost it. Sorry. Sorry, hopefully, can you still see? I just crashed. Okay, so the cells in the disc produce all of these factors that call nerves into the disc. And there's a whole host of different factors that disc cells produce, known as neurotrophic factors, um, and also there's factors that pull in the blood vessels, such as VEGF. And then this substance P is a factor that can sensitize nerves to pain. So disc cells basically are producing loads of these factors. And again, these are increased by my favorite cytokine, interleukin-1. So what we see is that when you treat with interleukin-1, you get increases in these nerve sensitizers and nerve growth factors um, at both gene and protein level. So one thing that we postulate is this could be a difference between those patients where you don't see any pain, but you see degeneration. Sorry, it keeps going off. Um, could these be the patients where you see asymptomatic disc degeneration? Whereas those where you see the symptomatic disc degeneration, are these the ones with substance P? So could substance P potentially be a biomarker for identifying whether the disc is degenerating back pain? And indeed, disc cells produce um, substance P and the nerves in there express it. Now, one of the things that we um, seem to identify is we keep coming back to this cytokine interleukin-1. And it appears to be a pleothoric cytokine. So it affects the factors that pull in the nerves, the blood vessels. It causes the decreases in matrix synthesis. It causes the increases in degradation enzymes and cytokines and chemokines. And it's also thought to drive cellular senescence. But the argument is often, is it a cause or is it an effect of this degeneration? So here what we did was we took um, mice and knocked out the natural inhibitor of interleukin-1. And by purely doing that, what we see is this spontaneous induction of disc degeneration, which was associated with the same features you see in humans, so this increase in matrix degrading enzymes and also an increase in cellular senescence. So it appears that interleukin-1 is a key target within the disc degeneration and could be an identifying factor to stratify individuals. So to summarize, the intervertebral disc is a very complex structure. The outer annulus fibrosus consists of these highly organized collagen fibers, consisting of these sort of spindle cells within there that maintains it. And there's low amounts of elastin and proteoglycans that connect these together. The nucleus pulposus is consisting of lots of proteoglycans, which holds on to lots of water because of the negative charges. But there's not very many cells in there. These cells are producing the matrix that they live in, and it's a nice homeostatic regulation, and you maintain a good normal disc. During degeneration, you get this increase in cytokines, neurotrophic factors, enzymes which break down the disc. The cells generate clusters. They go undergo cellular senescence and enlarge. And you get this very broken down disc material and this destroys the tissue around the cells. It allows cracks and fissures to form. And the neurotrophic and angiogenic factors call in blood vessels and nerves from the local tissues, generating a very painful intervertebral disc. Now, the trouble is, is at the moment, we still don't know what the triggers are for the destruction in cellular homeostasis that you see in the disc. We know there is a number of risk factors of genetics within the disc, but many of these have not been repeated in large enough cohort studies to have excellent confidence. There are some factors which have, but many of them need extra work. We know that abnormal loading can be a trigger for damage to the disc. And also there's lots of environmental factors such as obesity, smoking, um, and potentially infection. But the, the intervertebral disc is very a complex tissue and you can't just look at cells alone because the cells produce their extracellular matrix, they interact with that extracellular matrix providing a loading system. The different loads will then affect the cells and how the cells respond will also depend on what the genetic background is. 
There's also this um, where the possibility of low grade infection could be linked to potential disc degeneration. And the evidence for this is not strong at the moment, and that needs more investigation. So this really is where this for all was born. So it's really exciting to be involved in this training network. And what we're aiming to do is utilize a um, multidisciplinary team, which goes from so cell biologists like myself, geneticists, computer simulations, physicists, mathematicians, all kinds of different disciplines. And what we aim to do is bring the knowledge of the cells, the extracellular matrix, the different phenotypes you can see on imaging, and bring those all together in computer simulations so we can try and understand better the interactions which occur in this very complex tissue. So the ultimate aim of this for all is to actually enable a better understanding of the causes of this degeneration and what's different in each patient so we can develop a mechanistic biological stratification of intervertebral disc degeneration phenotypes for low back pain patients and the hope is is that this will then allow better treatments to be developed for those individual patients which would then benefit from particular treatments once we know what their cause is. So I'd just like to acknowledge all of the previous PhD students and postdocs and collaborators um, that have worked on the, the data that I've presented today, and of course, all the various funding streams, and particularly this for all, which is an exciting new adventure. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Now I should stop sharing. Okay, so Christine, thank you very much. So if you have any questions, so uh, please uh, just go ahead. Yes, Leo, please. Uh, I think I, I'm not sure I can unmute you. Or you. Oh, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Now, okay. now I can unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Christine, for the very, very nice presentation. It's very nice to see this holistic approach. I have a question. I, I mean, if you were a pharmaceutical company, what do you think would be the most appropriate target? Should it be like on the interlookings, on the MMPs, on the Eurosensitizers? Where you would bet uh, your chances so, of succeeding? So a pharmacological target is actually quite difficult in the disc because um, to get, so let's say a protein um, into the actual disc is very difficult because it's a very vascular area. So if you were to just treat with a, a systemic drug, it wouldn't really get into the disc. Um, but there are other ways that you can manipulate. So there's gene therapy mechanisms, there's cellular therapies, or if you do sort of long-term um, delivery mechanisms as well, those could be targets. I think the key targets would be the underlying uh, mechanisms, which basically have the knock-on effect of loads of other factors. So I, I mean, I've been working on interleukin-1 for 20 years, so I've probably got a little bit of a, a bias towards that. So I think interleukin-1 is a very interesting target but also things like substance P, because that seems to be a key factor that leads to the sensitization of the nerves. It depends what you want to do. So if you just want to inhibit the immediate pain, then maybe substance P or NGF markers. But if you want to stop the degeneration, then I'd probably go for something like an interleukin-1 inhibitor. But we really need to know what the initial cause of that factor is, which at the moment we don't know. So I think that's why we need this for all to get that the next level up to know why we actually get those changes so we can then target them. Does that Thank answer you. your question? Yes, 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 of yeah. course. I mean, I have another one, but uh, if you go uh, the same question, but in terms of biomarkers, what do you think would be the most, uh, no, the best so, uh, biomarker that can capture most of the people? And uh, yes. So again, the biomarker. Yeah, biomarkers, again, in the disc are really tricky because of the avascular nature. A lot of the factors which we see increase in the disc do not relate to systemic increases. So, for example, you know, we know that the disc degeneration, we get increased levels of interleukin-1, but you don't see those increases in the systemic circulation because it doesn't go out to that environment. Um, I think imaging is going to be a key mechanism to be able to identify biomarkers. And with the improvements that we're getting now on imaging technologies, there's some really exciting ones where actually you can 
use the imaging to determine the pH in the disc, or you can utilize it to identify whether there are um, you know, particular factors in there. So for example, uh, lactic acid or there's infective agents in there, you can actually see that now with imaging. Um, not diagnostic imaging as yet, but certainly in research. And I think those are probably going to be the ways that we can actually measure it in patients because you're not going to want to take a bit of disc out of somebody because actually that will make them a lot worse. So we really need the images right. to get better. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So uh, I have congratulations from Vicky Varghese. That says excellent presentation. And uh, thank then you. I have a question from uh, Maria Segara, uh, who is asking: Have you identified any primarily uh, mechanosensor such such as primarily cilia that could sense injurious loadings? Yeah, so we're actually just looking at cilia at the moment, and the the aquaporins that I was talking about, we've actually found that some of those aquaporins are co-expressed with cilia. Um, there's a paper just about to come out on that, actually. Um, but yes, yeah, so disc cells do express cilia. We don't know whether those cilia change during disc degeneration. There are a few studies looking at cilia within the disc, but they certainly are a primary mechanotransduction pathway. Um, but there's actually a lot of different mechanotransduction pathways within the disc. So there's um, the ion channels, there's the integrins, there's cilia, you know, there's a whole host of different factors, so trip channels and things like that as well. Um, and they do change during disc degeneration. So at the moment, there is quite a few different studies looking at things in isolation, but what we need to do is bring them together. Okay, uh, thanks. So I guess you have also answered to the second part of the question of Maria, which uh, was, uh, could it be associated with a uh, specific signaling pathway? So since you have related aquaporins actually with uh, signaling pathway, so I think the answer is uh, is yes. Yeah, and we there's quite a lot of work as well on the signaling pathways for the cytokines. So and we know that during disc degeneration you get increased um, activation of NF kappa B pathways, you get increased activation of P38 MAP kinases, and also the ERK pathway. Um, so there's a number of different signaling pathways which are more active in a degenerate disc than they are in um, you know, non-degenerate discs. So those could be linked to cytokines, growth factors, um, mechanotransduction pathways. They're all kind of interlinked, which is why it makes it so complex. Thanks. Which is why we need a computer model. <laughs> I, have a, I have a couple of questions myself. Um, it's more curiosities than very uh, very specific uh, specific questions, but so uh, we can identify so a, a lot of, a lot of uh, molecular uh, mechanisms, the so alteration of which then uh, would contribute to the disc degeneration. But if no, uh, we want to tackle the problem ahead in time and and think about uh, identification of early risk factors and uh, somehow uh, prevention or at least uh, uh, at least taking action so that uh, heavy degeneration so happens later in time so what would be uh, what would be the molecular targets to monitor or what would be the specific traits uh, to monitor and what could be the specific actions or is it still science fiction <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think we're getting better at understanding what those earlier changes are during disc degeneration. But the, the trouble is, of course, is when we're working with human tissues, we get human tissues at the end stage degeneration. You know, so we only get human tissues when they're being taken out during surgery. So obviously those are going to be the ones which are already in that disease state. And we do get non-degenerate ones as well for whether, you know, being taken out for other reasons or, of course, from cadavers. But Often from kind of cadaveric studies, it's often hard to tell whether those patients had pain. Um, you know, you don't always get that information. So picturing the early stages of degeneration on tissue samples is very difficult. And that's where we need to actually do kind of the live imaging and understand with the imaging, et cetera, how you can see those early changes. Um, and I think previously the imaging quality wasn't good enough. Um, but with the improvements and the different types of imaging technology that there is, you know, and there's, there's people in this consortium that can talk about this much better than I, um, 
you know, that actually I think that is going to be a really exciting avenue of being able to identify early changes so we can then target those patients. But we need to know what those triggers are that then start the cascade, um, which I see in the degeneration later on. Yeah, so I guess this is where uh, actually um, longitudinal population cohort become extremely useful. No? Should we be able to yeah. read correctly then the data that these cohorts are giving us? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I mean that. Yeah. Sorry. I was just I was just going to say, I mean, I think that's really essential to actually understand and decipher the kind of the asymptomatic symptomatic question as well, because if you can follow features that then actually do predict for that individual developing back pain, then can you actually identify those patients before they develop the back pain to a point where they're actually, you know, needing to see the GP, et cetera. Yeah. And then my second question was about um, uh, molecular therapies, therapies or the use of biologics in order to uh, slower down um, this degeneration or even try to reverse it. So if we have identified so uh, very specific molecular targets regulation within uh, regulation pathways, um, how can we how can we deliver so these uh, these drugs or these therapies so that uh, they don't have any uh, systemic side effects that would be unwanted because if we put an inhibitor of specific molecule within the pathways, how can we ensure that we are very specifically targeting uh, the cell we want? Yeah, so there's a number of strategies that you know different groups worldwide are looking at. So one of them is sort of gene therapy uh, approaches, and actually that's what my PhD was on many years ago. But it kind of went out of favour. Um, the gene therapy approaches at that point because there was the the terrible accident in France of um, a, a, a small child that was having a gene therapy therapy and you know, it all, it all went wrong, but that's coming back in. And actually, I think that that has a lot of potential. Um, it's about delivering that gene, though, then directly to the disc and making sure that you can transfer it. There's also mechanisms of, you know, protecting protein delivery or peptide delivery with sort of polymeric surfaces and biomaterials to try and protect it to get a longer term release. Um, because, of course, the trouble is, as many of the growth factors or small molecules have very short half-lives. So if you just inject it into the disc, it would go within a few days and not have any effects. So we've got to find ways we can get longer term um, responses. And then you probably, depending on the stage of degeneration, you probably want to then combine it with an ability to promote regeneration of the disc as well. Um, so you can then combine that with biomaterial strategies or cell therapies, um, you know, and there's lots of groups looking at that as well, including mine. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I guess we're um, basically uh, right on time. So that's that's just perfect. Is there? We can take a last question, if if any. Oh yeah, there is one. Um, So uh, Milad Fatih is asking: uh, Is there a link between mechanical load? and uh, C-gas sting pathway related to intervertebral degeneration? So that's not known as yet. It is something that we want to look at um, to see whether if you put excessive load onto the discs, do we then get DNA damage? Um, no one's actually investigated that as such um, within the disc yet. It is something that we're just starting to look at actually in our lab in another project. Um, okay. So yeah, interesting question. And then maybe a last question uh, by Kevin Souza. He's asking, uh, so similar to rheumatoid arthritis, uh, is there hypersensitivity response and activation of complement pathway? Uh, is anaphylaxis seen in severe cases? No, so the, the disc is, um, it doesn't tend to have sort of any immune response in there. Um, so you only get immune cells coming in um, once you've got rupture of the actual disc, and it's not a major effect. So whereas in arthritis, both in rheumatoid and also in osteoarthritis, you have quite a high um, involvement of inflammatory cells. Within the disc, it's actually the disc cells themselves that are producing these cytokines. So often people assume that when you hear 
you know, interleukin one, that it's immune cells, but it's not immune cells, it's the disc cells. So you don't really see sort of complement activation um, and that those kind of responses within the disc. Okay, so thank you very much, Christine. So uh, there are uh, two requests for other questions from uh, Sagar Sanjay and Leonidas Alexopoulos. Uh, unfortunately, it's already four o'clock, so uh, I think we need now to uh, close the meeting, move forward, because uh, some some people have other commitments. Uh, Christine, thank you very much again, and uh, and and very nice talks. And uh, yep. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. So, bye bye.